computer. Recording in progress. Okay, I'm gonna go back and share screen again. Well, we'll wait a couple more minutes uh, and just, I'll, I'll just sort of start doing the program at 7.15. So we're 15 minutes late starting, which is not very good, but things happen. Well, it's 7.15, so I'm going to get started. I apologize uh, for the delay and the confusion on the Zoom link. We'll try to do better our next meeting in February. I'm Howard Marcus. I'm a co-president of the St. Croix Oak Savannah Wild Ones, along with Roger Miller. I'm going to be moderating, and Roger's going to be keeping an eye on chat, answering questions and things like that. Um, this is a Lawns to Legumes uh, program. We're going to hear from of uh, Dan and Brett. And in a second, we're gonna, I'm gonna uh, go to the next page, which has their bios and things like that. And we'll look at that real briefly, and then we'll start the program with Dan. Um, so, but I wanted to welcome everybody. If you have questions, please put it into the chat. Please keep your mute on as much as possible and the video off. Um, as a hint for me, um, I, I've been taking pictures with my cell phone of information I wanna keep. It's a lot easier than writing it down. You know, if you wanna, get Dan's uh, email written down or Brett's it's it's for me it's easier to just take a picture of it and look at it later and then at the end we'll have a final wrap up and, and a th thank you for attending so I'm going to go to the second page and I'm just going to spend I'll let you all spend a minute or two uh, looking at the bios and um, I'll try to be patient which is not my strong suit and then we'll, I'll stop sharing the screen and we'll have Dan um, give the first portion of the program and then Brett give the second. And again, if you have questions, please put it into the chat. Well, I'm hoping everybody's had a chance to look at this. We can go back at the very end also, if you remind me, and if you want, we can go back and share this screen again as a final wrap up. But I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and invite uh, Dan to share uh, his screen and, 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 and start his program. Chat. Okay. Let's see where that... Hey, can you see my uh, screen? Okay. okay. I'm seeing this chat. Yeah, can you see yes. Um, for people, uh, everybody, uh, please, please uh, mute your. Yeah, please, at the bottom of your screen. Please mute yourself if you're not. It says we're. Yeah. I, Dan, I think you can. Okay, just... I'll get a. Okay, sounds good. Well, it's good to be with all of you tonight. Uh, again, I'm uh, Dan Shaw with the Minnesota Board of Water and Solar Resources, and I'll be talking about the Lawns and Legumes Program. I'll be giving uh, some background on the history of the program that started back in 2019, uh, talk about different components of the program, and then next steps of where we're headed. 
Uh, starting off, the mission of our agency is to improve and protect Minnesota's water and solar resources by working in partnerships with local organizations and private landowners. Uh, definitely working in partnerships is a key aspect of the work that we do and is important for this Lawns and Legumes program. We're relying on a lot of different partners to play different roles with this program. And I'll get into more detail about that as we go through the presentation. Uh, we definitely have big concerns about uh, wildlife species around the globe. Uh, there, there's research showing that insects in particular are decreasing in populations at alarming rates. It's estimated that more than 40% of in insect species are declining. <clears throat> Uh, bird species are also declining. There's an estimate 3 million less birds in North America since 1970. Many of the birds that are in decline are species that rely on insects um, as food sources. In the case of the rusty patch bumblebee, it's estimated that its population has declined about 80% over the last 20 years. And that's a major focus of this Lawns and Legumes program is benefiting the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. With our agency, we have multiple programs that are working to restore habitat. That includes conservation easements. We have cost share projects that are doing riparian plantings. The Lawns and Legumes program is primarily focused in urban areas. Uh, we also have a habitat friendly solar program and a new habitat enhancement program where we have an RFP out currently for that program as well. Um, all these programs play different roles and can help fill different needs within landscapes helping to build habitat corridors and that's a big emphasis of what we've been doing with programs is trying to find ways to establish intact corridors and habitat connections for different wildlife species. The funding source for lawns and legumes is the LCCMR, Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. That's through the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. And the program since the beginning has been about establishing pollinator habitat projects on residential landscapes across Minnesota to benefit the rusty patch bumblebee, but also other at-risk pollinators. I mentioned partnerships at the beginning and really partnerships are a key aspect of this Lawns and Legumes program. There's a large number of partners that are involved in different ways. Wild Ones is one of these partners that's assisting with the program. Um, so we've been very fortunate to have a lot of um, assistance with the program from different organizations. With the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, Minnesota State Bee, uh, we have information from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about areas where the species is remaining, which are the areas in red uh, on the map here. <clears throat> um, Really, we're, we're using this information as, as guidance for our program about priority areas for this species. <clears throat> but we're also focusing on additional species moving ahead. Uh, we have a large number of species that are at risk. And we're using this program to increase awareness about additional pollinator species. One of the projects we're currently working on is an adopt a pollinator resource uh, to help uh, kids, families, and schools Yay. Um, work on pollinator habitat and just really expand awareness about different species that are in decline. With the program, we have three different components. There is a public education and outreach um, campaign. There is individual landowner support that includes uh, $300 grants, coaching, and workshops. And then there's a demonstration neighborhood component. Uh, we currently have an RFP that's out for partners to work with residents across the state um, developing habitat corridors. And I'll talk about each of these components in a little more detail. 
Uh, some of the highlights of the program, we have about 100 volunteer coaches. I'll talk a bit more about coaching. It really plays an important role for this program. Spent about 130 published articles about the program. Uh, we won an environmental initiative award for large scale sustainability impacts. Spent over 36 workshops, features in different magazines and uh, media. Over 175,000 visits to program websites, which has been really important for this program. Applications from around the state. And then we really focus on the equity components to this program and have an equity plan for the Lawns and Leggings program. Um, the coaches play an important role by working with residents who are receiving individual uh, support funding through this program. Different uh, residents receiving funding have different needs, and so we're trying to tailor the program to those needs. Uh, we have about 100 coaches currently, and we're trying to recruit additional coaches. So if anybody on the call tonight is interested in being a coach for the program, um, you can go to this Blue Thumb website uh, to become a Lawns and Leggings coach. Uh, we also have a Lawns and Leggings partner webpage for this program that provides a lot of information such as planting design templates, habitat guide, um, this wide range of information for uh, different partners such as cities and county staff that are working on pollinator habitat. We have some sample ordinances in here um, that can be useful for cities. From the beginning of the program, we felt it was really important to develop some different resources for residents, whether they were receiving funding through this program or doing projects on their own. Our planting for pollinators guide is one of the resources we developed early on. We also developed a few different planting templates. That's actually an area of the program where we want to expand. Um, there's been a lot of interest in planting templates and we're really focused on expanding do-it-yourself projects through this work. And these planting templates can be really useful for increasing do-it-yourself projects. We've had four different uh, practice sites that we've been promoting for this program, uh, native pocket plantings, beneficial trees and shrubs, pollinator lawns and pollinator meadows. It's been helpful to have these different types to give options for landowners. If they have ordinances that are more restrictive, in some cases, planting beneficial trees and shrubs might be an option or a smaller native pocket planting. So just having these options has been helpful uh, for the program and uh, has um, really helped expand opportunities for, for landowners. Also with the program, with the focus on the rusty patch bumblebee, we've been trying to highlight different plant species that play really important roles for that species, including bergamot, Virginia bluebells, goldenrod, blazing star, giant hyssop, columbine, asters. Uh, we've been trying to find species that bloom in different times of the year so that um, we're improving habitat throughout the seasons for the rusty patch bumblebee, but also other pollinators. So I'll go through these different uh, project types. First with native pocket plantings. Actually, there was some recent research out of the UK that uh, even really small gardens provide high benefits for pollinators, partly because these gardens are cared for. And so the plants that are within them can be really good sources of pollen and nectar. Uh, so we've, we've seen other research pointing to the importance of these small gardens. So we try to stress to residents that even smaller projects like this can really uh, provide many benefits, particularly if we have them scattered throughout neighborhoods. <clears throat> there can be different variations of these plantings, such as rain gardens, lakeshore plantings, and boulevard gardens, um, all playing different roles within landscapes. So they can provide water quality benefits in addition to uh, buffering riparian areas and providing habitat for dragonflies, damselflies, and other species. 
pollinator trees and shrubs. Um, there's many options for these that provide benefits to pollinators. I think sometimes this is under recognize the benefits that trees and shrubs can play for pollinators. Uh, so there's this has been a good aspect of the program, raising awareness about how trees and shrubs can be incorporated into urban landscapes, but we also have some bit larger scale efforts to try to increase them in rural landscapes as well. Uh, with pollinator lawns, uh, these plantings can provide uh, water management benefits in addition to pollinator habitat, decrease emissions through decreased mowing. Um, so we've seen quite a bit of interest from, from participants in the program of incorporating pollinator lawns. Uh, different types of flowers can be incorporated into these. And we've also been developing some native lawn and metal mixes um, that are state seed mixes that we'll be re releasing pretty soon. And then pollinator meadows, uh, these tend to be larger plantings that could be planted from seed or from containers. They can really vary in size significantly depending on the landscape. But this has been another important part of this program. And so this is where we've been trying to expand different seed mixes that we have available uh, for these types of plantings. With the public outreach and education campaign, uh, one of the key goals of this program is to really build a movement towards adopting residential, residential pollinator habitat. And this outreach that's been part of the program has really played an important role with that goal. Uh, this has helped us increase awareness about our technical resources. And we've been working with the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, having their students develop social media. That's been some of the uh, more successful posts that we've had have been some of the artwork developed by these students and we're starting to work with a new class this spring. So we'll have some new social media that we'll be sharing uh, through this outreach campaign. With the indiv individual support grants, uh, we've had around 10,000 grant applications submitted. The application period for the current sign up uh, goes through uh, February 15th. So we're in a current sign up period for individual support. I uh, mentioned the role that the volunteer coaches are playing. And then also the focus on do it yourself projects is a really important part of these individual support um, projects and the overall effort around individual support. Uh, the Blue Thumb partnership has been playing a really important role with individual support, working with individual uh, support recipients, coordinating workshops, working with the MCAT students, and then coordinating the coaches. Uh, their staff have been great partners on this effort and are continuing to be involved in phase two. One other part of the individual support I wanted to note was that when recipients are completing their project, we have them map their project, but we also are encouraging people who are doing projects on their own that are, are doing projects um, without funding that they also map their projects. And so on this Blue, Blue Thumb website, there's a mapping um, web page. <laughs> and so anybody on this you know, call, we encourage you to go to this page and um, you can zoom into your location and, and map your project. Then with the demonstration neighborhood projects, these are larger plantings intended to enhance pollinator habitat and key corridors, raise awareness within neighborhoods for residential pollinator protection and showcase best practices. We have an RFP that's currently open through February 3rd for new demonstration neighborhood projects. These are projects of between 20 and $40,000. Cities, counties, watershed districts, conservation districts, tribes and nonprofits can apply for this funding. And again, these are to build pollinator corridors working with multiple residents within uh, geographic areas. We do have different models where some of these are very focused on urban areas. 
um, like that picture in the upper right is in um, North Minneapolis and staff working with residents um, through that area. But we also have some examples um, such as in uh, Carleton County, Cottonwood County, where there's larger corridors stretching across larger geographic areas. So we, we've left the definition of neighborhood pretty flexible for this program um, and leaving it up to the project partners to decide um, what their corridors will look like. Uh, this map shows the current distribution of demonstration neighborhood projects in the state. Uh, we're hoping to have an expansion of these across the state. We uh, can fund more of these with this current RFP that we have out. Um, so we're looking forward to having many more of these projects across Minnesota. This is an example of a demonstration neighborhood project in Anoka County. They have a really well-developed um, web map for their projects. <laughs> so each of the projects that they're currently working on are uh, have a feature on their website. So it's been a good way for them to highlight these demonstration neighborhood projects. And then moving on to uh, next steps for this program, uh, we'll be focusing on building um, on the pilot phase or so wrapping up the pilot phase. There's uh, still some funding from the pilot phase that will be used going into this spring and summer for individual support projects. But then we'll also be launching phase two of this project. Uh, we have additional funding through the LCCMR for phase two to fund both individual support and demonstration neighborhood projects. So we're moving into phase two, which will be ongoing for a couple of years. I mentioned our interest in increasing awareness about a wider range of at-risk species and using that adopt the pollinator program. And then another key part will be recognizing the, the accomplishments of residents who are participating in the program and different partners that are working with us uh, through this program. And I, I think, you know, as I finish up here, I, I want to stress the um, importance of partnerships to this program. Um, if anybody listening today is interested in partnering in different ways, definitely get a hold of me and I can um, provide information or put you in touch with our uh, communications coordinator if you're interested in using some of the social media or other information. All the resources that we've developed for this program are shared resources also. So we encourage other organizations to use the information that has been developed through this program. And <clears throat> finishing up, this uh, page has information about how you can take action with the Lawn to Legumes program, it includes some of the websites, um, the um, social media access for this site. And then we also encourage people to be uh, tracking locations of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee on Bumblebee Watch and iNaturalist. That provides important information for this program as we understand where Rusty Patch Bumblebee is showing up um, with this program. So um, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Brett. And then we can, uh, I think we'll have questions at the end after we both finish up. Okay, sounds good. Share my screen here. Let's see if I can find it. Let's see. One moment here, it doesn't seem to be popping up. Oops, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. So why don't we take a, a couple minutes for questions here while I try to figure out this technical issue here. That sounds good. Yeah, everybody's on mute right now for the most part, but I think if you unmute to ask a question and then make sure you mute again. Oh, oh, oh it started, maybe, yep, never mind. Don't unmute. Looks good, Brett. Okay, there we go. So 
Sorry about that. I had so many windows and tabs open that I had to scroll through to find the right one to share. Um, but thank you for bearing with me. I'm Brett Stobelstead. Uh, I'm with the Washington Conservation District. Um, we are a soil and water conservation district governed by Minnesota state statute under section 103C. And our mission is to enhance, protect, and preserve uh, the natural resources of Washington County through conservation projects, uh, technical guidance, and educational services. And we've been doing that since uh, 1942, thereabouts. And uh, we work with a long list of partners to, to do our work. So we work with eight watershed districts throughout the county uh, to help implement their cost share programs uh, targeted at uh, improving water quality and in, in uh, creating new habitats on the landscape. Um, we do free site visits for Washington County residents every year. We usually complete around 200 or so, and that's to help um, talk through strategies for implementing cost share projects and uh, helping landowners with uh, ongoing maintenance or uh, restoration or uh, installation needs that they have related to their conservation uh, projects. And we also help uh, facilitate access to uh, state and local grant programs, including lawns to legumes through Bowser. And we also host um, a couple dozen or so workshops every year through the East Metro Watershed Education Program or NREP um, led by my colleague Angie Hong, which is a really great program. They have a really great blog and website, which I'll include uh, links to towards the end here, um, along with some other great resources um, from our partners that can help kind of um, support some of the work that Bowser is doing here and that we're working on as well. And so our work related to pollinators over the last couple of years, few years at least, um, has really been centered on these well, four main uh, principles. Oh. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a lot of our mapping in initiatives have been working to clarify some of these um, uh, some of these highlights. So mapping uh, existing core habitat areas or refuge areas throughout the county. Um, identifying places where we can connect uh, existing core habitats to create uh, uh, area, larger areas of more contiguous habitat or a larger habitat matrix. And along with that was a, a, an initiative in 2016 or spurred from the 2016 um, executive order by Governor Dayton uh, was a pollinator sweet spot analysis that we, we worked on with uh, Bowser to map uh, both areas um, suitable for creating pollinator habitat and supporting the rusty patch bumblebee specifically. And then also came with that a proximity analysis to identify um, areas of existing habitat, um, furthest uh, habitats from those areas and sweet spot, the sweet spots in between where pollinators would be able to essentially use those as islands to get from um, core habitat to core ha habitat. And so since then, we've built on that, um, working with the county on a natural resources system framework, which is in progress. Um, but it's taking that a step further to look at land cover data, um, lands that are that are currently being uh, that are currently protected uh, under conservation easements or um, are publicly owned and looking at, um, you know, where those corridors can be developed uh, through these uh, initiatives that we're working on with Bowser and with uh, landowners and watershed districts in the county. And so you can see here this federal, uh, this is the, the high and low uh, potential zones here on the left uh, that was developed by um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that plays into a lot of our mapping and prioritization efforts. And over there on the right, you can see how that relates to um, the prior priority areas developed by Bowser and um, how that plays into our, our own uh, mapping initiatives with the county. And so I'm just going to circle back to a few of the slides that um, Dan was presenting related to uh, rusty patch bumblebee habitat needs and how this program can really address um, 
some of the needs out there and some of the some of the things we can do to to create uh, habitat, both in terms of floral resources and nesting habitat for rusty patch bumblebee, bumblebee and and other at risk pollinators. And so, creating nest nesting habitat is a big part of that. Um, providing a diversity of floral resources and um, sustained uh, blooms throughout the year, um, and in maintaining um, uh, overwintering habitat, which is something that I think um, it's the little things that we can all do. And um, it's, it's, it's hard to break old habits. I, you know, I still find myself, it's, it's hard to resist um, raking up and, and bagging uh, leaves. Whoops, let's see. I, did I stop my share there? Okay, there we go. Um, it's it's hard to, resi to resist to bag up leaves off the lawn and and uh, throw them in a bag and um, and just send them away. But you just really focusing on on maintaining that leaf uh, litter and cover, uh, raking those leaves into the garden, providing uh, cover for uh, hibernating insects, um, and in not removing them until the following season. It's really important. Um, and you know I think there's ways that we can design for those um, maintenance practices. And that's something that I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit a little bit about today, how to integrate the habitat needs of uh, pollinators and insects with some of the design principles that we're working with and that are that are uh, outlined in that uh, planting for pollinators design guide um, as a jumping off point, you know, where, what are some of the other concepts that we can think about as we're designing practices for pollinators? And so thinking about the four practice types, native pocket plantings, pollinator beneficial trees and shrubs, pollinator lawns and pollinator meadows, um, you know, what, what other uh, ecology concepts can we think about when we're selecting a plant palette or designing designing a new area to to carve out and and plant up, or uh, a, an area of turf that we want to enhance with uh, beneficial for species. So, you know, the timing of site preparation and maintenance comes into play. Um, species selection um, and and selection of uh, genera and families and functional groups as well, I think, are all really important considerations. Uh, particularly in, you know, in exurban areas where, you know, down the street, there may, might be a, a multi-acre restored prairie. You know, I think we have a lot of control working in our, in our gardens to, to decide what resources are there for pollinators. And so thinking broadly and trying to incorporate species that maybe have been a little bit underrepresented or, or families that have been underrepresented in the landscape is it is kind of a fun thing to think about, um, and then again going back to overwintering habitat. You know how can we think about design and using cues to care? You know going back to Joan Nassauer to allow our design and uh, allow our practice to be dynamic and and be messy within a certain area. Um, and so I'm just going to go through a few examples. Um, I, I mentioned, um, you know, we do, we do site visits every year for Washington County residents. And um, we also were coaches for uh, our office, our staff, our coaches for Lawn Selegium's uh, grant recipients. And so the, uh, some of these examples are from uh, homeowners I met with over the, uh, this last summer. And I think there's some really great examples of practices that, that were implemented um, and it, I'm going to show one roughly from each practice, uh, starting with native uh, pocket plantings. And so this uh, image here on the right was um, actually installed um, kind of on the fringe or within a larger uh, restored prairie and pollinator meadow. But I think it does a really good job of setting up those cues to care and those different levels with larger patches of individual species. It's actually quite a diverse planting. Uh, and we're catching this about uh, midsummer. You can see some coneflower in there, um, yarrow. Uh, there's some asters uh, getting going in the back, uh, Joe pieweed. And, um, you know, it's, I think it was an example of a really successful planting. Um, 
and flipping forward um, in a slightly different example. I th thought this one was quite unique. It's in more of a, a suburban area, um, but a really great example of setting up an educational space um, and using these small interpretive paths. This was actually designed by um, the owner, homeowner themselves. Um, and uh, they kind of created these pocket plantings bisected by this uh, chip granite path and, uh, path and kind of used it as an edu educational space for their neighbors, which I thought was really uh, successful. And you can see its progress progression throughout the season, moving left to right through site preparation and installation and uh, what it ended up looking like the following season. Uh, you can see a strip of uh, permeable pavers and um, a pollinator lawn strip there on the right uh, entering into the garden. And then each one of those quadrants planted up with one or two species to make it readable and legible, legible but also incorporate some species diversity. So um, I thought that was a really good example of um, how to incorporate um, you know, a number of different um, forms of um, organization and also, you know, maintaining some diversity in that planting. Um, pollinator lawns, uh, we have one here at our office that was installed in 2018. I think Dan actually showed a couple pictures in his slide, his slides, um, but they can be a really good way to um, to incorporate floor resources into if you have a lot of turf, you know, it can be kind of, it can be daunting to try to convert that all at once to, um, you know, a more diverse native planting. And depending on the site preparation method that you use, this can be a really simple way to uh, benefit pollinators and it do it fr from a very cost effective uh, standpoint. So um, these are some of the species that went into our mix. Uh, and these are pretty typical in a lot of Belon seed mixes. Uh, we have self heal, creeping thyme, Dutch white clover, ground plum, and calico aster. And we actually chose to reduce the, the quantity of Dutch white clover in our mix. You know, depending on the soils that you have, uh, it can be a little aggressive and a little bossy. So we, we uh, toned down the Dutch white clover in our mix and and it, and it was a 8,000 square foot planting. Uh, it was, the site was prepared using a scalp and overseeding method. So it was mowed as short as possible and overseeded with the, the B-Lawn mix. And um, now it's doing really great. Um, I would say self heal and creeping thyme and calico aster are all pretty well represented in that seed mix. And it's, it's mowed uh, roughly two to three times a year, sometimes less, maybe more often uh, less than, than that, especially this last year with the, the heat and the drought that we had. Um, but um, it's, you know, it's coming along really nicely. You can see here on the left, um, there's quite a bit of um, self-heal um, and creeping time in there. You know, we do have to battle south, south thistle and some other weeds that crop up here and there, uh, but we try to do our maintenance without using herbicides and uh, we've been able to, to maintain it well. And it's, uh, it's really, it's getting fuller and fuller and becoming more uh, self-sustaining year after year. Uh, pollinator meadows. I think this is probably one of the best opportunities that we have to really um, think about um, some of these ecology concepts that are um, that can really work for us in terms of long-term maintenance and and uh, being resilient in the landscape to environmental stressors. You know, think about the drought we had last this last year, uh, or cool season grasses that uh, that inevitably are often kind of make their way into larger prairie plantings. Um, but um, this, I'm going back to one of my first examples, this was a really successful, um, a very successful pollinator meadow in a kind of an exurban setting where um, they, they did a really good job incorporating a variety of warm season grasses, cool season grasses, early spring bloomers um, to through midsummer and into fall. This, you're catching this on the left here probably around June or so, you can see pops of um, uh, white baptisia there kind of scattered throughout 
over here on the right, you can see um, there's some yarrow, there's a uh, black eyed Susan, uh, I think that might be bergamot there on the right. There's compass plant. It's, it's a very diverse planting and, and it's been uh, maintained really well by the homeowner over the years. Um, and I think uh, it's an example of a, a successful planting that utilized a wide variety of species and functional groups relying on early successional plants through late successional species. Uh, and it's constantly changing year to year, um, which I think is something that we that we want to see um, and you know want to facilitate for larger plantings like this. And um, I think that's we're really interested in helping homeowners kind of think about those um, ideas when designing a, a practice like this. You know, we're still learning a lot, and I think um, there's a lot that we can um, that we can learn from each other and incorporate into our programs. Um, uh, year after year and really start to um, and create more diversity, more species, species richness on the landscape and, um, and start to kind of add back to some of these programs and develop them further as they, um, they go through uh, further rounds of funding and um, as more and more programs start to, to pop up. And lastly, I'll just touch briefly on uh, pollinator beneficial trees and shrubs. Um, I'll include a link in the chat to um, some great lectures by uh, both Heather Holm and uh, Karen Jokola at last year's uh, Pollinator Friendly Alliance uh, Festival related to uh, pollinator beneficial trees and shrubs and, and um, other forb species and how they support both generalist and, and specialist species. And they, they go over some of those more specific relationships, but um, the we have an annual tree sale. It's currently open. I know we're running low on quite a number of species, but um, we're offering bare root bundles of 25 um, for uh, a variety of trees and shrubs. A lot of them are, are beneficial for pollinators and they can be a great cost-effective way to uh, say you have an area of buckthorn that you've cleared in the last couple of years and you want to do some uh, some replacement, um, that's a great resource, resource to go to. Otherwise, the DNR's uh, nursery is also a, a good place to look for uh, those same species um, in similar sizes and for a similar cost. And uh, briefly, just to wrap up, I'm going to go over two active projects that we have that are um, a, at a larger scale, but um, you know, I think they're a good example of um, things that we're doing to, um, and we're working with Bowser to, to test and incorporate um, new pollinator pilot seed mixes into our projects. And so they're going to be really, really interesting to track over the next couple of years. Um, the first one is um, a project at St. Croix Bluffs Regional Park. Uh, we're working on it in partnership with uh, County Parks, uh, South Washington, Warsha District, the Pollinator Friendly Alliance, uh, and the St. Croix River Association. And it's um, we're working on converting roughly 18 acres of agricultural land and 20 acres uh, and restoring 20 acres of uh, oak savanna on the St. Croix uh, using um, pilot seed mixes that have been developed in the last few years or so. Um, and so this last uh, fall or summer, a good portion of the site was actually uh, converted to uh, cover crop uh, sunflowers for the 2021 growing season. And then uh, it was seeded just this fall. So here's some, uh, there's a map of the site. It's just I believe north of St. Croix Bluffs Regional Park. Um, and you can see the, the sunflowers were, were out there looking really happy for, for this growing season. And then uh, the seabed this, uh, this fall. And so next year we'll, we'll get to see what, what starts to come back and pop up. And uh, the second one, uh, Lake Elmo Regional Park. This has been an ongoing project with Washington County Parks. It's a big project. Um, if, if you haven't been out there, it's definitely worth taking a look. Um, County Parks is, is working on restoring, I think it's actually more than 166 acres of prairie and oak savanna within the park. Um, and a part of that as well is um, testing both a conservation grazing mix and a, a 
pollinator pilot seed mix. And I believe it's this area up here uh, on the, the county park map. My colleague, Tara Kelly, who's here is, uh, as well, she might be able to jump in and talk about more of the specifics on this project. But uh, part of that um, effort has been um, incorporating more grazing um, in certain areas of the park using goats. And it, there's actually a plan to use bison uh, in the long term to main, maintain some of these re restored prairie areas. So uh, that's pretty exciting. There's um, a story map on uh, Washington County's website that you can check out to learn more about those bison grazing areas. Um, but um, definitely go out and, and take a look. Um, a, a number of these areas that were seeded in the last couple of years are, are really looking pretty spectacular. So um, especially in midsummer or so. Um, so I just wanted to plug those really quick. Um, and that's, that about wraps it up. I think uh, hope, hopefully I didn't go too long. We have time for questions and, um, and hopefully a, a discussion here as well. So um, with that, I will, I will stop my share and I'll work on throwing some links in the chat. And Brent, if you can hear me, this is Roger Miller. I have posted in the chat box the links that you emailed to me. Okay, great. I'm going to just add one more in there. It's a YouTube link to um, that uh, Pollinator Friendly Alliance uh, Summit lecture by uh, Karen Jokla of the Xerxes Society. And you might also be able to find, I'll see if I can find the lecture by um, Heather Holm as well. I think it, it does a really good job kind of going to the, into more of the specifics on um, species selection and uh, pollinator species relationships, just, to, just for those who are interested. Well, thank you, Brett and Dan. I um, we really appreciate it. Uh, this is a good time for everyone to unmute and ask your questions and and uh, if you have any, and uh, Dan and Brett are here to answer as many questions as you all have. Um, thanks for mentioning the uh, tree sale. Um, I did uh, get some trees this year from the Washington County, but you, I noted too that the selection was rather low. Um, yeah. Is there a better selection? You mentioned DNR nursery. I've yeah, you might try the that. DNR. This year, I think, was challenging um, because of the pandemic. The, the yeah, DNR I, nursery fell um, uh, behind. They had operational issues related to the pandemic. So I think broadly inventory has Last been limited this year. Special, a solution to the world's garbage problem. Now, before I show you how Lomi is going to change the world, we, 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 we got a radio program on or something. Can you please mute you know, that? Hopefully that's not me. You're saying that are amazing at producing that smelly, gross liquid sludge. Raccoons, anybody? Maybe you don't have a green bit system. Who's but doing instead, that? You throw all your food waste in the garbage, which then goes I think everybody should mute if you're, unless, unless you have a question. All while still smelling pretty terrible. How do you guys do a total mute of everybody? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Okay. Even compostable plastics. Yeah, he might not be paying attention. You probably know us as the inventors of the world's first compostable phone case. Okay, well, I'm going to stop sharing so I can figure out how to where we sold more than 20,000 mute units, everybody. $7 million and became the most successful crowdfunding campaign of 2021. Fila customers yeah. have eliminated more than 41.8 million plastic bags. Somebody's got to... Those 20,000 Lomis I was Who talking is about, that? they're going to have okay. even more benefit, preventing 1 million pounds of coal from being burned. We're just getting started. Well, what's we weird is I hit mute all and I'm still hearing it, so I'm hoping it's not me. Waste from going to landfill. Howard, it's on you. Yeah, Howard, it's you. Say, I have a question if we're still taking questions. Um, Go ahead. Okay, so I did not realize that is some great stuff that Washington County is doing. And um, you've got some great 
great example projects there. How much um, coordination, is there any kind of like coalition or task force or something already in play between state, county, you know, bringing other counties into it, the local governments, like, so we're all getting on the same page um, with this plan. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll I'll ask Tara to jump in, uh, who's been working on those last two projects that I mentioned. She's been involved uh, involved with for uh, for the last couple of years, working with uh, those partners that I mentioned. So she might be able to to clarify that a little bit more. Yeah, I would say in in the county at least, we used to regularly meet. This is probably pre pandemic. We um, even quarterly with, it was members of um, the county, the Pollinator Friendly Alliance, um, some of the watershed districts, really to talk about initiatives. And I would say those meetings really helped form the foundation of the partnerships that we have going on that are really getting a lot of projects done today. There are a lot of um, state level groups, and I actually am going to pass that one off to Dan, because he probably knows more what's going on at the state level to kind of keep everybody engaged and, and on the same page there. Yeah, and I can talk uh, about the, the state level. Um, so there is a interagency inter pollinator protection team that brings different agencies together to work on pollinator protection. Uh, that started with the governor's executive order. Um, Really, with our lawns and legumes program, it's one of the ways that we are trying to partner with a large number of different organizations across the state, uh, bringing in different counties, uh, conservation districts, watershed districts, uh, um, just trying to have uh, that program act as um, a, a tool for marketing and then developing different resources, sharing that information around the state. But we also have other programs that are serving different purposes, like we have this new habitat enhancement program that's focused on conservation lands and natural areas. Our RIM program is far focused on conservation easements. Um, so there's different programs that are available for different needs. And, and those are programs that conservation districts, watershed districts, different organizations can work with those uh, funding sources. And yeah, you have yeah, a yeah, hand up? Yeah, I, I, go ahead, Ann. Yeah, I'm in Ramsey County and I love the stuff that's going on in Washington County, but I don't know anything that's going on here. Uh, we would like to do lawns to legumes next summer. Um, what, how do you go about with the grants uh, for that program, and would I be would be be eligible? Yeah, uh, with the demonstration neighborhood grants, you know, there's quite a few different eligible applicants. It can be cities, counties, watershed districts, conservation districts, tribes, and nonprofits. So if there's a group that's interested in Ramsey County, uh, you could work with that group, like a neighborhood could work with a group to form a demonstration neighborhood and then submit an application. That application is coming up relatively soon, being November um, 3rd for the due date for that RFP. So there isn't too much time left in this current round uh, I haven't heard specifically from the county or cities in Ramsey County if they're applying or not. I would imagine we'll be getting some applications from different groups in the county that are proposing these demonstration neighborhood projects. Um, otherwise, the individual support applications are also open, and those are open um, through the 15th of February. So that's the other way that residents within Ramsey County can apply for support through that individual support part of the program. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I looked on the website, but I didn't see specifically where I could make an application. I've been on the list for years, but never won the lottery. So is money available for people who want to do it or is it still a lottery? Yeah, we have, um, it, it's similar to how it's been run in the past. It'll be that same lottery type system. Uh, anybody that's applied in the past will be re-enrolled in the application. So if you're, if you've applied in the past, um, you'll be in the current application. You don't need to reapply if you've done so before. So um, in other words, encouraging new applicants to sign up. So basically, I just have to win the lottery again, right? Yeah, there's a lot of applications that are coming in. We do have a, a ranking. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I don't have to make a specific proposal. If I win the lottery, then I get a chance to do it or what? how does that work? Yeah, once your name is in the system, <clears throat> then uh, we'll be doing the application or we'll be um, doing the selection in about mid-February. So if you're awarded, you'll be hearing from us around that time. And I should also mention, um, depending on where you are and um, in Ramsey County, the, there are several watershed districts in Ramsey County that have really great cost share programs. And um, Ramsey Conservation District also has a similar program to ours where they offer a uh, free on-site consultation and design uh, assistance for landowners in, in Ramsey County. So you can also look at some of those areas too. And um, I could see if I could find a couple links. I know Ramsey, Washington, Metro Watershed District, that's one that has a really great cost share program, uh, Capital Region Watershed District. Um, I would also look at, at um, your local watershed district and, and um, conservation district, county conservation district. I'm in White Bear Lake. White Bear Lake, okay. Let's see. I, I, I don't have any understanding of how I would go about talking to a watershed district. Yeah, why don't, um, I'll put my email in the chat. If you wanna shoot me an email, I'm happy to, to, um, to help you get in touch with the right person if you don't mind. Okay, we already have a full pollinator garden and okay. we just want to do the lawn and ramp up our pollinators a bit. And, uh, but it, it would help to have some grants. We could really do it this summer. Yeah. Thank you. Question. Yeah, Leslie, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, mine kind of ties in with hers a little bit with Ann. Um, what about Hennepin County? Do you guys have any? Um, I know it's a little bit different with Hennepin County, is there, who would you recommend in terms of the neighborhood approach? Um, who would you recommend that I speak with? We've had some interest from the city in the past. So I, I would um, you know, recommend, it, recommend connecting with our environmental services with the city and see if they're planning on submitting an application for this round. Um, I think there's a good chance that they probably are, are thinking about submitting an application. I don't, I haven't heard from them about any specific area that they're thinking of focusing on, um, but definitely check in with them. Some of the nonprofits within the county have also been involved with projects like Metro Blooms yeah. has led a couple of projects. Um, you could also connect with them and see if they're planning any demonstration neighborhood projects and where those lo are located and whether they might they might be located in your area. So that would be the best approach. I'm looking at a um, really high density area where we already have an island of um, native plants. And so we'd be really interested in having it supported around us in this neighborhood around us. It has very little green space. And, um, and so I think that, you know, uh, it would be an interesting project 
because the dent, you know, with the density and the, the lower level of um, green space available to people in this neighborhood. But um, I'm just not sure. So I've got kind of a location in mind, but you're saying that it's better to hop on with somebody that might have projects in other areas. Well, well, possibly, um, you know, okay. there, you know, there's quite a few different applicants that could be applying. So I, I think it'd be best to check first with some of the organizations that might be applying. Okay. See if you could add the project on to what they're thinking oh, of. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so for Bloom's environmental services for the city, right? Yeah, I think they'd be a good starting points to check in with them first. Okay. One other thing I didn't mention in my presentation is that we did expand the demonstration neighborhoods to include community spaces and educational landscapes um, with this round in addition to residences. And also um, apartment buildings are eligible to be part of these as well. We wanted that to be Part of the program from an equity standpoint. Yeah. So there, there's a fair amount of flexibility as far as the combinations of residential and community spaces. We had a lot of interest from cities interested in doing things within parks and you know school landscapes also. So that is an expansion of the program this time that we're um, expanding in, into some other types of landscapes for an educational component. Yeah, Dan and Brett. Um, no, wait, wait, I, I, I've got some other. Go questions. ahead, Howard. Uh, yeah, Dan and Brett. There's a couple of questions in the chat. One from Jennifer uh, for lawns to legumes. Mm -hmm. Is there something in particular that? Whoops! Now it moved on me. I was just looking at it and it moved. Um, is there something in particular that gives one app some applicants an edge over others for being awarded grants? And then uh, Brett, for you. Um, does anyone know offhand of what the city ordinances are for still water in regards to lawns and legumes uh, in terms of a front yard garden from Carol? So those are two questions in the chat. And then, uh, and then we had another question uh, at the very bottom that you might want to look at. So if, if Dan and Brett, if you can answer those two. I can start off with the uh, selection for individual support recipients, there, there is a higher score for residents that are in the Rusty Patch Bumblebee priority areas in the state. And then we also have points that are awarded for secondary priority areas. If you go on to the website, there's a priority area map. You can see where those priority areas are located in the state. Um, there's also a point given if, uh, residents are within environmental justice areas of the state um, from the pollution control agency's map for environmental justice. Um, so there's a point um, scoring system that's used um, for the selection of residents to go along with the uh, focus on rusty patch bumblebee and other at-risk uh, species. And then Brad about Stillwater. Yeah, to my knowledge, I, I I don't know that there is an ordinance that would um, that would prohibit plantings over a certain height. You know, we've we've implemented a number of projects in the Stillwater area over the years. Um, you know, boulevard and and um, front lawn plantings, and uh, the landowners that we've worked with, there's there's been no problem. Tara maybe uh, maybe has some insight uh, being a Stillwater resident. Um, yeah, I don't know of any, and we've done lots yeah. of projects in this area. So I, I was trying to think if there's any hoops there, but it's it's worth a call to City Hall just to describe your project and make sure it's in line. But um, the Stillwater in general is pretty supportive of pollinator plantings and rain gardens and those types of things. Okay, and then Dan, uh, Chris Johnson had a question about um, plans to expand, um, if, you, if you can see that in the chat. Yeah. Do you see that, Dan? Uh, yeah. There, yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, it looks like uh question is, are there plans to um, expand lawns and leggings to the rest of Minnesota counties, um, with, even without the homeowner grant component? Um, yeah, we are trying to find ways to expand the work around the state. Um, it's part of the interest of uh, expanding to other benefit other species other at-risk species. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee zones are more focused around the metro currently and then in the southeast parts of the state. Um, so with the demonstration neighborhood projects, there will be additional points given for other at-risk species that might be found in different parts of the state, which should help us allow to have demonstration neighborhood projects around other parts of Minnesota. Um, and then with our ranking for individual support, I think that'll keep evolving in the future as well. We did break the state up into different units to make sure we were getting distribution around the state for recipients. There was higher scoring for people living within the Rusty Patch Bumblebee zone. So we definitely had more projects funded in the metro area for individual support. Um, but we'll be looking for ways to even out that distribution around the state because we do want to be supporting insect populations in all parts of the state. Um, so it's it's been an ongoing process, you know, constantly evolving, trying to figure out how to make the process as fair as possible for residents across state while benefiting the beneficial insects that we're trying to um, help through this program. So um, definitely something that's on our mind and has been an evolving process. Okay, thank you, Dan. Ann had a question about how to, how to go about getting signs for gardens as pollinator gardens. You got any insight on how to get signs? I, I can start with the lawns, the legumes. <laughs> signs and Brett, you might have other um, thoughts there as well. Uh, so um, people who have been funded through the program receive a lawn so legume sign, both for individual support and demonstration neighborhoods. We do have some additional signs for people who have been doing projects on their own. Um, so if you have been working on a project on your own and you're interested in a lawn so legume sign, uh, email me and I can put you in contact uh, with the Blue Thumb Partnership who's distributing the signs for the program. Uh, we have a limited number of signs, but you know, essentially we, we do have some extra ones at this point that we can uh, mail out. So let me know if you're interested in a lawn so legume sign. Yeah, and also for a while, I know uh, wild ones, and maybe uh, I, I know at least the Twin Cities chapter, um, you could register your garden um, online. Um, and after a, a two or three years of establish, establishment, you can post a sign um, displaying your, your project, which would also be visible on the website. So um, that may or may not still be around, but it, it, you could take a look at that as well. And I'll just interject too. I know at our office, we had four different sign types that we were giving away this year. One of them was a pollinator garden sign. I know we had them at the state fair and we were giving them out then. So I'm guessing we still have some around yeah, I think we do. We distribute too. So Brett gave his email. I'm, I'm sure they're probably in our education room at the office if people are interested. What, what is your office or how do we contact you? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put my email back in the chat. Uh, we're located in Oakdale. Um, so you can visit our website, um, WCD, let's see, mnwcd.org, I believe. Is that right, Tara? Right. Yeah, mnwcd. And then I'll put my email back in here just so it's here at the bottom. And then there's another question in the chat from Susan about um, lead mixes. Okay. Elon I, I know with the Belon seed mixes, um, there's different companies that are 
supplying those mixes. I know Minnesota Native Landscapes is one. Twin Cities Seed is another one that has Belon seed mixes. The DNR has a vendor list for native plant suppliers and restoration companies. Uh, they have been adding Belon mixes into that um, into that resource. So companies that are providing Belon mixes in addition to native plants are listed in there. So that would have a more complete list geographically around the state for companies that can supply B-Lons. And Brett and Tara, you may know of others more locally that might have them. Yeah, we keep our own uh, material sourcing list as well. And we're happy to share that with you if you want to reach out via email and we can talk about your project and, and, uh, and point you in the right direction for a seed mix. Great. Other other questions. Uh, Dan and Brett have stayed pretty late, and Dan's not feeling that great, but um, they've done a really good job of answering everybody's questions. Are there uh, more questions, or can we come close to adjourning? I wanted to let people know that we are going to try again next um, February fifteenth. Uh, talk on a, a tamarack um, swamp marsh fen area that should be pretty interesting. We'll have a, a, a fen expert talk about plants and hopefully the, the Zoom links will work better than what I did today, but we're gonna give it another shot next month. And Dan and Brett, you did great and your presentations were super and we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. No, no problem. We, yeah, thank you. It's been really good. Are there last minute questions before we adjourn? Uh, and I stop recording. Yeah, I should also say keep uh, keep an eye on our website. Um, we sh we should in the next month or so uh, open our website back up to site visit requests, and it'd be it'd be fun to meet with some of you. And uh, if you have projects in mind, we can talk about that and um, and uh, maybe get some things moving forward. So that'd be fun. That'd be fun for me. So uh, <clears throat> thanks so much. I I just wanted to uh, uh, say as well that. Uh, Promoting this as a um, one of the coaches along lots of legumes. I've got a lot of traction at the fair and and stuff too by um, stressing the angle of of uh, you know promoting water quality and water conservation and also even climate change. You know, with cutting down carbon emissions and um, so there's there's a lot more interest in in getting to uh, launch the legume program. And more of that in the landscape, uh, from than uh, just with the, you know, even the um, the rusty patch. So uh, it's really exciting program. Thank you. Yeah, Lynn and I are mentors on the East Metro, and we've we've enjoyed it very much. Have, trying to help people get a front yard pollinator garden in. It's, it's people are, people want it. People care, and I, I think there's a lot of excitement about it. So we're happy to help. Well, if there's no more questions and no more everything, then listen, thank you everybody. And um, hopefully we'll see you next month. And Dan, you get well. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Brett, you can come by our house anytime. We have a, the, the whole yard is pollinators, front yard rain garden. It's, you can come midsummer. I think you'd like it. Cool, that sounds good. Okay, well, everybody, I'm going to stop recording and end the meeting and we'll see how it goes. So thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone.